Thank you for joining me on today's video. Remember, if you like my videos, please remember to subscribe, hit that little notification bell so that you're made aware of any future videos that I release. In today's video, I'm gonna give you five steps to starting your independent insurance agency. I started mine in September of 2010. Next year will be our 15th year in business, hard to believe. Made a lot of mistakes along the way. For any business owner who's watching this video, I'm sure you could appreciate that because it happens, right? There's things that you don't learn until you do them yourself. In this case, I'm gonna go over a few things that are pretty self-explanatory, but also potentially some pitfalls to look out for. Some things that I could have done differently and I hope it helps you. I hear from a lot of insurance agents around the country. I know there's lots of people looking to exit the captive world to start an independent agency. It's a whole different business. Besides what we sell, it's, and even that's a lot different, you know, the distribution models really don't align. So for people in financial services, you know, if you have a financial advisory firm, if you have a property and casualty agency, if you have a life and health agency, and maybe you're just going to do employee benefits, different types of property and casualty, whether it's commercial lines or personal lines, this could help. So I think the first step and something that self-explanatory, but you know, maybe people, they get excited, they put the cart before the horse, the filings. And if you're in California, like we are, there's different steps you have to go through the Department of Insurance to ensure that your licensing is proper. If you have a license as an individual, you were an insurance agent and now you're starting an agency. You have to get licensed as an agency. DOI laws require that you send in information to clear the name before you can file it. California has very strict guidelines about how you can name your agency. Other states I've seen, you could be a lot more creative, which is great. It's California, right? So there's going to be a lot of red tape, but you have to get licensed, file for your entity. And I tell all business owners this, you should never operate as a sole proprietor. You're just leaving way too much liability out there. You want to have that barrier that's created by the entity, whether it's a corporation or an LLC. And then of course you have to figure out how you want the taxes to work, the taxation. Because if you file for a corporation, you could be a C corp or you could be an S corp. If you're an S corp, you're going to have pass through taxation. So those are all things you want to consider. If you're going in with a partner, legal ramifications, buy sell agreements, making sure everything's out on the table before you start operating. You never want to get to a point where you have a dispute with a partner after you've already started the business. And let's say you're three to five years in. Now your business is rolling and you have a problem. Nothing to fall back on, right? Buy sell agreements, funded properly with life insurance policies or key man insurance. All of that stuff's going to be really, really important. Finding a good attorney to file your entity, to create your entity, file your statement of information or whatever you need to do with your state. So all of that stuff you should do first. Let's call it the legal structuring, the formation of your entity, the licensing and all that stuff. Do it first. Step two is going to be your branding, your logo design, your website. Obviously a big part of branding today is your web because I don't know about you guys, but in my insurance agency, not many people walk in here. All of our work is done over computers and phones and remotely. So your website is a big part of your brand. Colors are important. The name's important. Think about what segments you want to reach. Think about how you want your website to be designed or formulated. Any printed documents that you want, letterheads, cards, pamphlets, brochures. And I know that this costs investment, right? There's money involved here. Before you open a business, you should have enough money to get all of this stuff off the ground. Get all your social media pages ready to go, Google business, your Yelp, get all your online presence ready to go. This is all plays part in your branding before you open and start writing business day one. Step number three, another big one, you're going to have to figure out what contracts you want to go after for your insurance carriers. And a lot of that is going to depend on what products you want to sell. Don't try to be everything to everyone. I think this is one of the mistakes that I've made early in my career. We did a lot of generalist type work. Luckily, we came from a background of a niche in construction. So we knew a lot about the construction markets. We knew a lot about how to write, how to insure, how to service construction companies. We had a lot of contacts in the insurance world for construction markets. We knew carriers. We had relationships with underwriters that wrote construction. That was easy for us to get that off the ground, that niche. But I would say develop a couple of strong niches at first and go after that to try to get your feet on the ground, try to build a foundation. That could be product-based or industry-based. Something that we did early on was we focused heavily on workers' compensation in California for some of the other industries that we wanted to go in. Hospitality, manufacturing, technology, because we know that in California, workers' compensation is a requirement for any business to have, even if you have one part-time employee. We figured if we're going to spend money in marketing and we're going to try to get in front of people, at least get in front of a product that people must have. Now, you could be wanting to do personal lines only, right? Home and auto. Well, how are you going to get yourself out there? You're going to join networking groups. Are you going to
to join local social media groups to try to get in front of neighborhoods. Next door might be a good option. I know that personalized agencies out there have a lot of success with Pinterest, supporting local community events or setting up stands at local events, whatever it may be. The product that you're going to write and the segment of the industry that you're going to go after is going to determine a lot where you want to place your resources for advertising and marketing dollars. If you're going to go after commercial lines, you know, maybe local networking groups would be better off. If you're going to go after employee benefits, you know, how are you going to get in front of the decision makers at companies to provide benefits for their groups and then go after those contracts with insurance companies? Now, in 2024, the year that this video is being released, direct appointments are going to be difficult unless you can really commit to premium volume or unless you have some history there where you can move some business to these carriers to grow the business quickly. You might have to join a cluster or an aggregator. Mistake number two, read the contract with the cluster or the aggregator. One of the things I hear more than anything else in this industry from other peers is that they hate the fact that they're in certain contracts and they can't get out of them. Well, you should know that ahead of time. Also, your contracts with your insurance companies, if you get direct appointments, will dictate exactly what contract rights and agreements under the provisions. If things start to go sideways, you know what your rights are with the appointment of that contract. Read your contracts, read the paperwork before you start signing. But this step three is going to be kind of hand in hand. Know your markets, know what you want to write, and then go after the carriers that can provide the product that you can write in those specific markets. Step four to starting your independent insurance agency or financial services firm is to know your technology stack. Here's a big mistake that I made over the years. Okay. Shiny object syndrome. I think a lot of independent insurance agency owners have this and it's understandable because you hear about all this technology and what's the next best great thing that's coming out and how can it improve your efficiency and how can it improve your productivity and how can it help your bottom line if you have too much of it or not the right amount of it or not the right fit for what you're doing it's going to deplete your bottom line it's going to cost you more money a lot of tech providers have contracts also that you can't get out of read what you sign when you agree to this stuff but I would say go slow implement slowly. Start with your AMS, which is really important. I would look at all of the products that are out there, not just settle on the first one you see, what's going to be the best fit for you, but think five to 10 years down the road. Think about the growth that you're going to grow into and whether or not that tech provider or that partner is going to be the right one for you as you grow. Okay. Maybe not what's today because nothing's worse. And I did it than moving from one AMS to another. It took us 11 months to move all the data. It was tiring. Okay. To say the least, we did it in 2019. I will never do it again. We made sure that the provider we have today is going to be the one we want to be with for the next 40 years. You should do the same. Your AMS is not going to be everything to you. People that have been in the industry know that. What systems are you going to use to sell? Do you want a separate CRM? Is your CRM going to talk to your AMS? What kind of communication platform do you want? What kind of app do you want to bring to your clients or portal? All of this stuff application management systems. There's so much out there, but you got to be careful again about what you bring and the terms of how you bring it. Don't get the shiny object syndrome. Think that you need everything. And another thing is, is if you have a team, okay, if you're starting with the team or as you're hiring, you don't want to overwhelm your team with too much of this because it could get frustrating for them. I did that a lot early on. I think I've gotten a lot better in the last 10 years at implementing slowly and really only bringing changes if it needs to be done. We've built heavily on the platforms that we use. Another platform to think about is your e-signature platform. How can you integrate this stuff? Does it talk to each other? Is it creating more keystrokes or less keystrokes? Are you forcing your employees to do double entries? All that stuff is really, really, really important. When you talk about technology, there are other ways out there through RPA, through AI that you can build efficiencies, but not put too much of the pressure or too much of the workload on your team. And the fifth step, and probably one of the most important, but it also floors me, is purchasing the right professional liability insurance, the right E&O. You're an insurance agent. We help a lot of agencies with their E&O programs, especially here locally in Southern California. We have a lot of agencies that are life and health focused only, personal lines focused only, and they don't really understand professional liability policy. So they rely on us to help them with that. And that's great. You know, we love helping other agency owners. I go in forums and I see owners posting about, oh, my premium went up this amount. Where can I get the least expensive professional liability policy? Well, you're going to cause yourself some issues by doing that. I mean, as insurance agents, we should know better, right? There's going to be a lot of subpar insurance policies out there for insurance agents, just as there would be for other business owners. We talk about this stuff all the time on my channel. Protection is key. A few things that you should know, claims made versus occurrence. Most E&O policies for insurance agencies are going to be written on claims made policies. Well, how does a retro date come into play? If you do switch carriers, making sure that your retro date stays in place. If you change limits, you're going to 
have different retro dates on those limits. That's important to understand. Duty to defend clauses. Does your carrier have a duty to defend? Is it written in your contract? Even if it's a frivolous claim, do they have a duty to defend you? And do they have a duty to pay for those defense costs? Or is it a reimbursement type policy where you have to pay and then get a reimbursement? Really, really important stuff. Other things, insurance and solvency exclusions. There are exclusions on insurance E&O policies for agents that exclude coverage if the carrier that you place business with goes insolvent. You got to read those contracts, read that language and understand, well, what does that mean for me? There are areas of the country now that insurance companies are going insolvent more rapidly with some of these catastrophic losses or claims or storms, fires, whatever it may be. There are smaller regional carriers. A lot of them have gone into conservatorship or receivership and gone insolvent. They're no longer around. What if you have a client that you write business for that sues you because that carrier is no longer there to handle their claims? Read those forms in your policy and understand what you're purchasing. Another big part of an insurance policy for insurance agents that you should look out for is consent to settle clauses. Is there a hammer clause in your policy? Meaning if your carrier wants to settle a loss and you don't consent, how does that affect you? Does that lower the amount of coverage that is provided to you or the amount of payment that your carrier is going to make on your behalf? Are your defense limits inside or outside of your policy limits? Sometimes more inexpensive policies have defense inside. So therefore it's going to exhaust the limits of liability on your policy. Whereas having defense outside gives you a separate limit for defense costs. Defense costs could get very expensive, especially when defending a lawsuit on an insurance agent's e &O policy. So these are all things that it's important for you to know in every section of this video. One, two, three, four, and now five. Read what you're signing. Read what you're buying. Insurance policy is no different. So those are five steps to starting your independent insurance agency or your financial services firm. We help a lot of financial services firms. Wealth management companies is a, is a niche of ours that we've worked with for many years. Love working with wealth managers. We can help if you need that help. But if not, I hope this video was helpful for you to start your agency. And I hope to see you around at events. If you have any direct questions for me, my number is 858-384-1507. Love helping other owners get started. I did it myself. It is not easy, but no one said it was, right? But the benefit and the reward, every then you get back from all the hard work is, is well worth it. You can also email me at mike at foagency.com and please support our channel. If my videos are helpful, including this one, give me a thumbs up. Please comment if you have any comments or questions and I will reply. Thanks again for watching. Hope to see you soon. Take care.